Greetings, folks. Mark Anthony Kay here for the Look, It's Rock and Roll podcast. And today, I'm very lucky to have with me a fantastic musician by the name of Jacob Montgomery, who is the singer and guitar player for a fantastic up-and-coming band called Freeways. How are you doing, Jacob? I'm doing well, Mark. Yourself? I'm doing really, really good. Uh, thank you very much for coming on and doing this. I'm a big fan of you guys. As you know, I've been following you guys from the very beginning and I've been following you for way back. We'll get into that as we talk about this stuff. Yeah, uh, sure. But yeah, I'm a, I'm a big fan of your stuff. And uh, for all those people out there who may not be too familiar with Freeways or yourself, let's start back at the very beginning, at the very beginning, no less. So what would you say are some of your very earliest influences as far as music and guitar playing? Uh, as far as music in general and uh, guitar playing, um, I mean, both both are kind of the same. I started with uh, guitar music. The first music I fell in love with was uh, pretty much hard rock and guitar music. Uh, the actual, um, I think the definitive moment in me falling in love with music is my earliest memory in life. Uh, it was a really mundane day. I was in the passenger seat in a car seat of my dad's van as he was driving to pick up bags of salt for the water softener. Mm. And, uh, and I remember the whole drive. I remember every song that played, it was a CD um, of like my dad's favorite songs from when he was a kid from like the very small window of uh, the, like 1968, 69 to like 74. Um, pretty much like end of elementary school and all of high school uh, t until the end of high school for him. So that was like the earliest songs I remember hearing and loving are like uh, Fooled Around and Fell in Love by Elvin Bishop, um, Run Through the Jungle by CCR, Jackie Blue by Ozark Mountain Daredevils, uh, <laughs> Jailbreak by Thin Lizzy, and then the first two bands that were – like my dad was big into that. I remember getting into more than just one song was BTO and uh, uh, Wings. I was big into Wings as like a very, very small child. Very cool. Very cool. Mm -hmm. So um, just uh, for everybody else out there as well who may not be familiar with you, uh, how long have you been playing guitar for? Well, I've actually not been playing guitar for that long. Uh, I'm... 27 right now and I probably picked it up around 15 or 16 by 11 or 12 years but I did start on bass first actually so I was playing bass from about 14 years old 13 or 14 years old Very so, cool. yeah so not you know in the grand scheme of things I, it doesn't feel like that long for me because I know guys who pretty much had a guitar in their hands uh, <laughs> from birth you know what i mean don the other guitar player in freeway I, I don't think he can remember not playing guitar yeah i know that feeling as well yeah. um so you guys obviously and you as well are obviously influenced by 70s 80s hard rock stuff yeah. obviously uh obviously new wave or british heavy metal stuff as well are influences as well um do you think that that influence for you started with your father and maybe some of your family and friends, or was that something that you just picked up on from some of your other people that you were hanging around with at school or something? As far as definitely not new wave British heavy metal. That's something I completely came to on my own. I didn't have any friends uh, throughout all of my formative years that were informing me of, or kind of, shaping my taste in music like at all like there were no gatekeepers at all i i <laughs> literally stumbled upon all of my favorite bands by chance pretty much um definitely like you know a good foundation for it though i mean the older i got the music i remember hearing or my dad showing me was like boston alice cooper mm. uh you know grand funk railroad black sabbath 
was around in the house. So there was like, you know, there was a foundation for it. And, uh, and when I was a little kid, actually, my uncle owned a guitar store in Mississauga uh, called a 440 So I remember being a little kid and, you know, in the early nineties and being around, uh, you know, the guitar <laughs> store and seeing like a very Wayne world like scene, seeing a bunch of like long hairs playing Charvel and Jackson's shredding <laughs> in the day, like and stuff like and from my earliest memories, that kind of stuff was always around, was always in the ether, you know, but um, yeah. as far as diving into like the stuff that really made me want to play it, um, totally like an accident. I actually can pinpoint the exact, turning point um my brother played high level hockey and was playing triple a most of his childhood and mm-hmm. that required my parents to drive pretty far on weeknights so they dropped me off to be babysat if it was really far like if they were in wheatfield which is pretty much buffalo new york uh they dropped me off at my uncle's house the one who i was speaking of who owned a guitar store and uh he had a little studio in the basement was recording a band so my parents dropped me off and he pretty much quickly sat me down on the couch, turned on the TV uh, and said, all right, help yourself to anything at the fridge. You know where the bathroom is, make yourself at home, call me if it's an emergency and ran back downstairs and continued recording this band. And the first thing that was on TV was uh, VH1 Classic and it was Classic Albums, Motorhead's Ace of Spades. Nice. Um, so I was in grade five and I watched the entire hour and my first two bands I fell in love with simultaneously was Motorhead and Hawkwind. And <laughs> that was like, once I found that, I was like, what the hell is this? And it was shortly after, you know, the next year in grade six, I found out who Judas Priest was. And then in grade seven is when it started to, you know, then you find Anthrax and Megadeth and Slayer and Twisted Sister and some of the other standard thrash heavy metal stuff, you know? Exactly. Yeah, so it's a, it's a very familiar story. Uh, like, as far as uh, influences, I mean, mine are probably, um, you know, a little bit before that because I am a bit older than you, obviously. But uh, not, nothing that you're talking about is unfamiliar to me, obviously. So very cool. Um, so let's get on to freeways a bit now so um when did you form freeways uh the exact date's kind of hazy because there was a lot of talk about doing it before we actually did it like um it's just this like a circle of friends in brampton hanging out always being like man we should you know we should play this kind of stuff as we're listening to records but likely six years ago somewhere in around six years ago um it was the core, like the core that is the band now. Um, myself, uh, Dom on guitar, Amar on bass, and Seb on drums was the original foundation. And then for a couple years, we went through a few singers, actually. Um, I'm the fourth singer in the band. Oh, really? Um, yeah, not a lot of people know that. We didn't play or do anything. And, uh, Actually, we did play. We played a couple shows with our original singer, Josh, who's uh, still very close with the band. Mm-hmm. And um, when it came time to try to record, uh, it wasn't working. So we amicably parted ways with Josh. And then uh, another friend from high school went to high school with me and Dom, because Josh was a high school friend. Uh, mm-hmm. Christina, she auditioned for vocals. She was just kind of going to guess. She wasn't going to stick around in the band. It was probably going to be more like a fill-in thing. And uh, she was too good. It was like, uh, <laughs> it was very pop. It was like very polished and very good. and Like not, not exactly what we were looking for, but uh, still very talented nonetheless. And then um, third was uh, like a bona fide, screamer a metal singer a buddy of ours named serge who sang in a now defunct toronto band called call of the wild mm. and serge was completely on board and he was rehearsing with us and he was ready and just as we recorded a, a song for a split seven inch um a couple songs actually uh what would turn into our first ep uh he just disappeared off the face of the earth 
He didn't. Really? One day he stopped answering phone calls and text messages, and we reached out to all of his friends in Toronto and all of his ex bandmates, and he just deleted all of his social media and didn't respond to emails or texts or nothing. Nobody, his phone line was disconnected, and I haven't seen the guy since, and that was four years ago or something. So then the band kind of faltered and fell apart a little bit. And after not playing for six months, I decided to get everybody back together. And uh, Amar took singing lessons. He was going to try his hand at singing. And then that wasn't working out. And everybody, because I had already been singing and Droid, just said, all right, Jay, just buck up and do it. We know you don't want to, but do it because I was adamant. I wanted to be in a band for once where I was just the guitar player. It's been like my dream my whole life. I just want to be the guitar player. And uh, it didn't work out that way. So it was either I suck it up and sing for the band or there is no band. So that's how we get to this point right now. That's how we get to uh, the current incarnation of Freeways, which has been the last four years. You know, it's an interesting story because for myself and my Project Gemini thing, it was the same thing. I wanted to you know, do stuff and get a singer to come in. But you know what? I thought to myself, if I wait for a singer to come in that I'm happy with, it'll take forever and I'll never get this done. So yeah, I exactly. did it myself. And that was the end of it. Now, you were talking about this, the seven inch that you did. You're talking about this here. Am I not correct? Uh, you're lagging, so I can't see what you're holding up. And I'm assuming you're holding up the cold front seven inch or tape? Yeah, I'm holding up the, uh, the, uh, the, four, the seven inch cold yeah. front. Yeah. Yeah. This so is- that, um, we actually recorded a cover for that seven inch that we dropped because it was a cover specifically picked with Serge's singing in mind. And it's in such a high register, I can't sing it. So we have a song with the music completely recorded that's just been sitting there for years. Really? Yeah. Interesting. Because, yeah, because uh, what I'm holding up, and I don't know if you can still see that, but. No, I can't up... see anything. Okay. So I have the. Uh the seven, the blue vinyl version that came with the patch here. Oh, yeah, there uh, it is. Yeah, so I got that. And uh, you also were talking about um, Droid before. I'll get to that in a minute. But I also have the cassette copy here, right. here of that album, the Cold Front. I have actually both of them here I'm holding up on the screen. Uh, the Australian got, and the Canadian version, yeah. Yeah, so I got both of them. And uh, very cool. And uh, you did talk about Droid. I'm holding up also the cassette of the Droid album that you did. Uh, and I had the cassette. Well, and, you, and, and you did too. Yeah, I actually was the one who mixed and mastered the Droid album. I, I actually mastered the Freeways stuff as well. Yeah, the, uh, the upcoming, uh, yeah, the up- mastered our upcoming album. Yeah, which we'll get to in a second. Um, here's just for people who are wondering, I'm holding up the cd for the droid cd as well i have the i have it on cd i have it on cassette and i also have the double vinyl color uh you talked about all the guys in the band so obviously your history is well known that you guys are friends from way back you know high oh, yeah. school so on and so forth one thing i found very interesting about this band is that you guys have a very 70s 80s style in your dressing too a lot of the old you know chip sunglasses stylists and the jean jackets and stuff like that the bullet belts and you know those kinds of things was that done purposefully to kind of push that you guys are a 70s 80s type band or is it just natural literally how we dress for the most part i mean i'd be lying if i didn't say it was you know you ask the other guys in the band, hey, what are you going to wear for band pictures? No, 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 dude, wear that that other shirt's cool. Wear that other shirt. But, I mean, you know, we've been yeah. talking for two years now about maybe we should go out and get some new, some new clothes so every band picture and every picture from our live concerts isn't the same rotation of the same, like, four T-shirts and two <laughs> pairs of jeans that we have, you know. But, no, that's just um, – that's just us, like – Amar, so I, I was mentioning earlier that, um, like, I didn't really know anybody who was really into music, mm-hmm. like, in my formative years. Um, Dom was the first guy. He was, like, our high school guitar whiz. He was, like, the guy, the hot shit guitar player in our high school. So Dom was, like, a shoe in for the band. You know, he was really into, like, in high school, like, Van Halen and Skid Row and some Annihilator and stuff like that. <laughs> And then, um, but Amar, Amar 
I literally met in high school through an old bandmate of mine from my first high school band um, because we were playing a house show at a party in Brampton and we heard rumor of like another metal band in town. Like there was just these other like diehards kicking around in South Brampton or something like that. So somebody found them on by searching like thrash and metal in MySpace, found this other band called Trench Kill and uh, just mess it, never even heard them. They didn't even have a song up and just were like, want to play the show? And they said, yep. And I met Amar when he was like 15 or 16. And I got a couple years on him. I, uh, so he must have been like 15 and I was 17. And um, and he was like, yeah, yeah, like he was just, it was immediately I saw him and he had a DRI shirt on and it was like, we're friends, <laughs> we're friends now, you know? Uh, so, Absolutely. Yeah, that's just us. Like that's, that's great. What what I wanted to actually get to as well, which I find absolutely uh, fantastic actually about your band is that a lot of bands when I go on to Bandcamp and stuff like that, you know, a lot of bands put up, you know, digital albums and stuff like that. That seems to be the route right now with a lot of bands. And it makes sense because, you know, you don't have to put out any money to make any product physically and you can put out a record and people can hear it and check it out. But what you guys have done, which I thought was fantastic, is not only did you do CDs, which is usually what the other product is that most bands do but you have done cassettes which most people thought was a dead medium for a very long time that nobody was interested in but lo and behold you guys are doing cassettes and it seems to be doing well for you guys and vinyl which you've done and seven inch vinyl too on top of that too so um do you find that the uh cassette end of things are starting to pick up a bit you think yeah i actually got into cassettes before i got into um vinyl or any of that cassette was the first uh, format of music I really collected, like being a teenager and having no money, like before I even worked, it would be whatever pennies I had saved up from, you know, the tooth fairy from when I was a kid or whatnot. People used to give them away. Yeah. Mark, you're, you're in Brampton. You'll know, you know, that Bibles for missions thrift store right across from uh, the YMCA in downtown yep. Brampton. I remember going there years ago and them literally having a bin of cassettes and they're like, here, you can have at it. And there was like a ton of Sabbath in there and Def Leppard, like the early, I think that's where I got my high and dry cassette and like all for free. They were just giving them away. And then I remember going to flea markets as a kid and it was like 25 cents for Saxon cassettes or, you know, any of that kind of stuff. Like, every triumph cassette i had i don't think i paid more than 25 cents or 50 cents for at the time and like so that's where like i I, it just made sense and then when i got a little you know when i got like 15 16 and kind of got tapped into like the underground thrash scene going on it was all demo tapes Hmm. um right yeah there's like a bunch of tapes i still have from uh from high school it's funny actually there's some tapes i bought when i was a teenager from some bands internationally and then you end up meeting these people like you know 10 years later just by chance meeting and going like oh son of a bitch i bought your tape when i was like 15 i know i know your little band you know <laughs> yeah um, that's that, great. that was always the for for me it always made the most sense like i didn't know anybody that bought cds it was like if you wanted to hear music in your car you usually had it on an ipod and you know, you had the little cassette adapter with the auxiliary. That's like when I was in high school, what everybody had in their car. And um, if you were into like kind of niche heavy metal and hard rock, you, you you bought tapes. And I mean, vinyl was the vinyl boom was starting, but it wasn't anything that it is now. And it was like that was like you know that was a dream. That was always the end goal, but like that was an, always an afterthought. When we formed the band. The first goal was like, Oh man, if we could just get a demo out on cassette, I'm like, well, it made it, you know? Yeah. Well, because it's, it's interesting that you, that you say that because, uh, and I'm going to prove that you're not just all talk with that because I'm going to hold up here the very first droid demo, which is mal- malfunction. I'm holding it up here. I have copy number two of a hundred of these here. And uh, that, so you did right away uh, a cassette right off the bat when you formed uh, Droid, right? So so obviously that was something that you believed in right from the very beginning. Now, uh, as far as Freeways goes and the uh, the three-song EP that you did, 
how do you think the cassette end of it went? Did it did it do good for you guys? Oh well, cassette was the first thing we put out. Like we didn't get CDs until this year. <laughs> oh, CD great. version of it, like um, yeah, it was. We did cassettes first. We did two pressings of cassettes. I think even before it uh, came out on uh, seven inch. Oh, fantastic! So then those were the first things. Then then the the blue seven inch and the black seven inch came out after. And then CD came last, which is absolutely fascinating. It seems most bands do it the other way, where they're like CD first, and then maybe they'd get a vinyl of it out. Well, we got we got offers, like we got right off the bat after the tape went out. Like it was like not a not a buzz release or anything, you know what I mean? But like it did it did well. It did it sold fast, and it, the response was only like surprisingly really warm, you know. So right off the bat, we got a like bunch of offers for vinyl um but first in was um anik and francois some friends of ours from uh, temple of mystery records who put out the seven inch and uh are putting out our album and are who we deal with exclusively you know they're they also put out um the droid album on cassette too they're the like yeah. they're the absolute best but um we got a bunch of offers for vinyl and CD to people being like, Hey, if you want me to put it on CD, but I hate pointless releases. Like I hate when bands do like a one song, 12 inch that's one sided and it's way too much money. I just hate like a waste of, of material. You know what I mean? So I was like, I, I was not going to do the EP. I'm not going to do three songs in like 12 minutes or whatever the hell it is in the length on a CD and charge full pop for it. That's what everybody was offering us. It seemed ridiculous. And I, I was like, nobody's going to want to buy it. Like I wouldn't want to buy a three song CD is stupid. And then, um, we got a really good offer to bundle it together with two other bands, EPs, Tanith and angel sword. Mm. And, uh, kind of like, um, like a, a tribute to these old Greek bootlegs taking like totally obscure uh, 80s metal albums and bundling <laughs> all, them all together on a CD. So uh, the Remembered Steel um, compilation came out and it's uh, us and the Panath um, Citadel 7-inch and yeah, like I said, the Angel Sword 7-inch, which are both like amazing. We were so on board. The second they said either one of those band names, I forget which they said first, I was like, hell yeah. I had the Tanith tape already and I had uh, I had um, Angel, which, or Angel, which, Angel Sword's uh, first album already. So it was like, once that offer was there, that was the only way that was getting released on CD. Fantastic. That's, that's fantastic. Um, so the new album that's going to be coming out April 2nd on Temple of Mystery Records is mm -hmm. called True Bearings. Uh, I got to say right off the bat, uh, having had the honor of doing the mastering of it, I know the album very well. It's a fantastic record. I highly, highly, highly recommend it to Thanks anybody much. who loves hard rock. Uh, definitely kind of based around like, you know, th I mean, people have said, have given you comparisons to like, you know, uh, Thin Lizzy and they've said stuff like even April Wine or stuff like that. And, you know, it, to me, it's a lot of that, but it also reminds me of some of the older Judas Priest stuff as well. It's just fantastic. I absolutely love it. Uh, one of the things I also love is that album cover, that whole Winnebago sort of motorhome on there and that is so 70s 80s like touring band tribute uh, i gotta say whose idea was that that was mine um actually i just told um i just told this story in an interview uh for deaf forever magazine out of germany uh yesterday i just uh, just told this story in an interview but i think it's going to be in german so i'll tell it in, right now and i'll say it in english um the album originally had a different title. So the album originally was going to be called A Dream Denied. Mm -hmm. um, up until very close to the album's release. Like, I think up until, I, I think when you were mastering it, it was still called A Dream Denied. <laughs> and I started thinking about it and I thought, no, that sounds too it sounds too depressing. It doesn't sound like us. You know what I mean? Yeah, what I was yeah. trying to allude to was like what most of the lyrical 
content is on the record, which is just like work and, you know, relationships and things that just like the realities of life and how sometimes things don't go as planned, you know, and, yeah. and uh, that's just like growing up, I guess. And, and, uh, but I thought like, ah, that's a bit too dark. And then I also thought like, fuck, that kind of sounds like a cauldron song title. And I was hanging out <laughs> with uh, Ian and Miles and uh, we were having a couple beers at Ian's old record shop. He used to run uh, Stain Class. Shout out to Stain Class, rest in peace. And then um, I was like, "Hey, uh, tell me if you think this sounds like a Cauldron song title." Uh, we were thinking about calling the record "A Dream Denied," and they were like, "Yeah, one hundred percent. That sounds like a song title, a Cauldron song title." It's like, "Ah, shit. Okay, back to the drawing board. Back to the drawing board." <laughs> and uh, we had an album cover done up for it, which we weren't very happy with um done by the same artist who did the cold front ep cover and did our current cover for true bearings and um we just thought ah it doesn't doesn't match the sound of the record we'll save that maybe for a shirt design so we had another friend of mine um do a, a different cover which ended up being the dead air shirt design mm. and shortly after we, we did that Oh, here's a catastrophe. We did that, and it's the Avro arrow flying through the air. <laughs> <laughs> With the original plan to take band pictures in front of it, so I'm like, yeah, that's a cool, like, you know, <laughs> that's an aesthetically cool choice, even though it's has no connection to anything <laughs> to do with the band. It's very stupid and corny. So then um, just as we did that, Temple of Mystery put out a record – with planes on the cover and then another Swedish band called Hypnos had an album cover that looked extremely similar with a plane on the cover. And I'm like, I'm not putting this out. And it's, if it looks like this, like that was a stupid idea to begin with. The cover looked incredible. We love it, but no, like back to the drawing board, take three. And then once we changed the um, album title to true bearings, we had already had our band pictures taken in downtown Brampton, actually right by that Bible's permission I was talking about. And we took the band picture in front of the Winnebago and I said, you know what? Let's just get them to paint that Winnebago on the front cover that we took band pictures in front of. Why not? Like I love camping. I love camping. That's my, like there's so many album covers with like hot rods and motorcycles and all this cool cliche rock shit on the front cover and that shit boring and played out and corny as hell. And I'm like, you know what? You know, what's the coolest thing in the entire world aside from like records and music is camping and going up North. And that's what I do every single weekend. I don't, I'm not recording or playing a show or going to a show. I'm up North. So I was like, you know what? Let's, uh, let's, uh, have a little homage to, uh, to camping. <laughs> Great. That's a, and I mean that's a great that's a great story because um, it also shows that uh, this whole preparing of a record is never as easy as one might think it is. I mean, you know, you, you went through three different covers, you went through t t various album titles. I mean, you know, us oh, the that's consumer. Just the start of it, Mark. That's just the oh, start of it. I can imagine. I mean, but us, the consumer, we're, we're always just lucky enough to go, hey, this is a really cool album. I'm going to buy it, right? We, we we never know half of the stuff that goes into it. So it's always great to hear stories like from you telling me what happened. We started the record. So last week marks two years since we started recording the record. The record's not even out yet, and it's been two years. Wow. Yeah, every, uh, every step of the way, uh, there's been setbacks uh, either – external or internal you know so we made a lot of mistakes uh when you do things yourself when you do things as diy as possible part of the process is um making some big mistakes and having to go back and fix them or live with them you know so of course yeah and uh given that we don't have much of a budget there's a lot of <laughs> having to live with them yeah so. well but I, I gotta say it from what i heard there to me there doesn't sound like there's anything really like wrong or anything that sticks out at all i think it's a fantastic record and i'll oh, stay yeah. i'll say it again it's an amazing record now Thank getting you. to it uh there's quite a few great songs on here i mean true bearings you got uh the time is no excuses fantastic you know one of my favorites actually is ba uh, battered and bruised one of the things i've always loved about that song is that you are one of the rare bands that i've ever heard that played you know this type of hard rock that had a saxophone solo 
in the song. Yeah. You know? I mean, that to me was like, that. talk about balls. I mean, want to tell me a little bit about how that was inspired? Yeah, I mean, we, uh, we, we, you know, we, we take things song by song. Mm -hmm. So we really try and make sure that every song stands on its own two feet. Um, I mean, it has to fit in context of a record. I mean, we're very conscious of that. Uh, you should see like the amount of bickering that goes on between Dom and I, and you know, we'll have a song and then we'll go, no, 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 we can't, we have to change the key. Ah, but it sounds good in this key. Yeah, but we already have one in E. We don't need another song in E for this record. You know, like that's our kind of process. But with that being said, each song has to have a moment for me that's memorable. Like a lot of my favorite records, there's these little idiosyncratic moments that make it like completely memorable and make you come back more. Like I see you're wearing a King Crimson shirt, Mark, like Lark's Tongues and Aspic or Red. Those albums have endless replay value because there's so many twists and turns and so many surprises. I mean, we're working within a lot stricter paradigm than King Crimson is, you know, we're working within a very meat and potatoes, hard rock format, just because that's what we want yeah. to play and what we like. But that being said, it doesn't mean there isn't room for more. So um, that chorus, once we recorded Battered and Bruised, it just sounded bland. It sounded boring. So we tried synth and nope, that doesn't sound right. And we tried bigger guitars and nope that didn't sound right and we tried uh, additional vocals and that didn't sound right so around the time we were doing the vocals uh recording um i had seen a band who i've known for a while from with members from brampton called animatist they're like a uh like post hardcore instrumental jazz rock band and uh danielle their saxophone players from mississauga not from brampton but um uh, one of my other bands played a show with them actually and uh she was the first person i thought of and i just messaged her on facebook and said hey danielle uh i know you're in guelph regularly and i know you have like uh you know the band is uh, like kind of plays more around guelph i'm recording um with a friend of yours and doing vocals in guelph would you mind popping in next weekend, um, laying down some saxophone just on the chorus, just a simple line? And she said, absolutely. And uh, she took the go bus in, and I picked her up at a coffee shop, and that was it, and we got it done in a day. And we just played her the part kind of on piano, and then she changed it and made it her own, and, and uh, that was that. Fantastic. I think it really suits it. It definitely does. I mean, there's, there's so many great catchy songs on this record the best thing for me to say is to go out and get it now with that said the best thing to do to get this record is to go onto Bandcamp and go to the freeways site right now they're doing a pre-order for it uh they did have they did have a by a beige vinyl with a keychain and a patch available but that sold out like pretty quickly already yeah, in like five or six days i think yeah, that, that completely sold out. Uh, and they also have a black vinyl version that's out. They also have a cassette version for pre-order. They also have a CD uh, available version of it as well. So definitely go on there and pre-order a copy of this. I, I, I think it's a must-have. And we'll, we'll, we'll be probably on a, quite a few people's list for album of 2020 for sure, I, I would I would say. So before we wrap this up, i got to ask you about one thing that's very important. Sure. And that is you've done... Uh, some some impressive shows, and you've been going out over into Europe now to play. Uh, well, you have, do you have anything upcoming that you want to talk about as far as yeah. gigs? Yeah, absolutely. So um, we are playing the Muscle Rock Festival in Sweden uh, last weekend of May, which is, like, huge for me. Um, we kind of, uh, like, we're fans of music first and foremost, so we kind of operate... Let's on um, some kind of like stupid strategic, what would be good for the band or what would be blah, blah, blah. It's like, you know, this is what we do. Like we all work full-time jobs and we're busy as hell and we're, you know, tired as hell. And, uh, you know, if we are going to do something with our time, it better be something we enjoy. So that's kind of what we go in um, thinking when we go to 
play shows or when we travel and muscle rocks my favorite festival in the world i went two years ago just as a spectator and literally was my best concert going experience of my life um so i i reached out to them and um took a couple months but i heard back and uh jacob the organizer of the festival messaged me right away and said uh yeah, I really, I, I, I love the EP. Uh, let me hear the album. I, Cause I mentioned we had an album coming out. You heard the album. He goes, yeah, I like it. Uh, you know, festival's almost booked up. Uh, I can't offer you, you know, the sweetest slot, but if you guys want, I can get you on there. And we said, absolutely. And, uh, so we have that coming up and then we have some dates in Germany. We're just working on right now at the moment. Um, not too much, um, everything kind of pending not everything confirmed but uh the first week of june we'll be doing another run through germany again and uh those are our main fixed plans right now and then shortly after we get home uh we'll be in rochester new york for the fourth of july um with uh reckless force out of new hampshire and uh fatal curse from rochester so that'll be also a, a, a wicked uh a wicked trip once we get back home. We got a lot. We got a lot in the work, you know. Yeah, absolutely. Now, this is my last question, and I don't sure. mean to end this on a on a sour note or a sort of depressive note, no, I... but we all know that right now the coronavirus has everybody shit in their drawers. Everybody's kind yeah. of you know wondering what the hell's going on. And I've been reading all kinds of stuff, whether it's you know Sons of Apollo who canceled their European tour, uh, their Kiss just canceled all their meet and greets now on their and their road tour. Uh, lots of shits happening that a lot of people are getting very upset about. Um, I'm going to keep my fingers crossed that none of this affects you guys because you have the luck that you have it a little bit further down the road, your stuff. But I have to ask, though, it must be on your mind, this, as far as booking dates. Yeah, it's all everybody talks about at work. It's getting exhausting hearing. I'm tired of hearing the goddamn word corona. <laughs> but uh, I'm not too concerned about it. I mean, I'm... Uh, a naive optimistic in the odd occasion uh, when it suits me. And in this particular occasion, uh, I mean, I haven't heard of any confirmed cases in Scandinavia. There might be some in Germany. Uh, I've been keeping a little bit of an eye on uh, flights and, you know, with tons of flights into Germany. They haven't had uh, a lot of cancellations. I think there's been a couple or a couple reroutings or whatnot. Um, uh as far as us like in by personal health i don't think that's a concern of any of us yeah realistically i think a lot of it is blown way the hell out of proportion i think a lot of it is media fear-mongering and um you know i'm not going to be flying into italy or iran or wuhan <laughs> province right now but you know <laughs> We'll, we'll see how things go, but at the moment, it doesn't affect any of my plans, and it, it doesn't seem like anybody is be, be in, at all concerned on the other end, especially not in Sweden. I haven't heard a single person over there, uh, like my friends or any uh, bands or organizers, um, uh, concerned at all. I mean, it makes sense. I saw, like, Madonna and cancel the tour or some of that kind of stuff, and, like, obviously, if you have, like, tens of thousands of people congregating in a place it's a different story you know what i mean but i mean yeah at a little festival in southern sweden with a bunch of heavy metal bands i think you're more concerned of fucking alcohol poisoning than you are of coronavirus yeah a amen amen brother so um yeah so i'm keeping my fingers crossed that all this is going to be long in the past when you guys start heading out uh, i'm going to conclude this by saying once again go to freeways Bandcamp site, check out their stuff there. Uh, buy the new record. Put put your pre-order in. I mean, you you won't do, uh, you you can't do any better than this album. That's really really fantastic record. I love it, and I'm not just saying that because I mastered and worked on it. I honestly say it's really really well constructed, played everything. It's a great record, and uh, I would highly recommend going out to buy it. Jacob, thank you very okay. very much for coming uh, on and doing this with me. And uh, I hope we'll talk again soon. Maybe after you come back from your touring, uh, we can talk about how it went. Yeah, absolutely, man. This was fun. I'd love to do it again.
the grand finale of the show We'll make it count before we go It's coming down to the wire No more help is on the line It's coming down to the wire No more help is on the line I waited for the ground to finally fall Reveal the gifts we never saw Remain potentially in the Void there is a sight to only fill the map of spite It isn't wrong, it isn't right Light is fading Slowly as we drift for foreign shores As if we're driven out by wars As if your home's no longer yours It's only waiting To re-emerge as someone new To rearrange my worldview To pour every avenue Thank you for watching or listening to this episode. Be sure to subscribe to us, like us, or even leave us a review. You can find us and join the conversation on Facebook. <laughs>